Welcome back to Seeker Strength and welcome back to SNC Coaches React. Today we're reacting to Jacko Gill. He is a discus thrower from New Zealand. Interesting enough, both of Jacko's parents were also throwers. He is the youngest ever junior world champion in the IAAF in the International Athletics Federation Association thingy magic. Uh, he is frequently inside the top ten, nay, the top seven at world Nay. championships as a senior now we've quite a bit of footage thank god for jacko uploading a lot of stuff for the last several years and over a decade on instagram so today's little narrative will take us right through some crazy lifting so he was junior world champion or youth, youth olympics when he was 15 so he's a, a sick cant you know the thing with jacko that just popped into my mind there is mm -hmm. the all blacks snc coach is called gilly yeah, yeah. I wonder is he related? Probably not. <laughs> so first up, we just have this picture, but I want you to take note of this time point. This is 538 weeks ago. Jacko is currently 28. So this is approximately 10 years ago. So Jacko is probably 18 here, and he is benching 211 kilos. So that suggests that Jacko was benching at least 200 kilos or more when he was younger than this, most likely. So this is a photo evidence of Jacko being... Well, I can only be described as a horse from day one. That's obnoxiously strong. As an 18-year-old. Now, we've got some squats mm, around 19 here. We don't know what the weight is, but we can say something like 220, would you say? I'd say 220. Yeah, I'd say 220. This is what I'd call hardcore two late 2000s training for someone who wanted to get training. Yeah, because that barbell weighs anywhere in between 18 and a half kilos and 24 kilos it's a different thickness on your right hand than it is on your left hand, and sometimes the ends fall off. It's They're both on ends, and yeah. the diameter is between 28 and 34 mil <laughs> at multiple different points across the barbell. But you know what? If you're squatting 220 with that barbell, mm -hmm. you are a strong fucker. What I love about that as well is that he, while he is using re knee wraps, he's also squatting in tennis shoes <laughs> or sneakers for sneaking. Yeah. Then we have, not long after that, so Jack goes around 20 here, power cleaning 172.5 kilos uh, with straps as throwers are wont to do. Oh no, sorry, just a wrist wrap. Uh, this technique you'll see Jacko using is a technique he'll use all the way through his career. And then we have a 127 kilo power snatch. That power snatch comes up so fast that it's almost surprising it's overhead. You know, mm. when he starts to stand up, it's like, oh shit, it's already up there. Yes. Yeah, 172, 127. So if he was a weightlifter, you'd give approximately 20 kilos on both of those lifts for a, a full lift, for a full snatch and a full clean and jerk. So we're looking at rounded up to 200 kilo clean mm -hmm. because using that for reps, 127, <laughs> that was for standing. So I'm going to give the man or at this stage, the boy, at least 145, if not 155, if he did a bit of training in weightlifting. While obviously not insane numbers for someone in the super heavy category, still insane numbers for anyone doing any kind of non-weightlifting endeavor. Uh, so he, he would conceivably show up to weightlifting worlds and do quite well at this age. What you're seeing here is this thing that we're always talking about is heavyweight fast for power athletes or essentially for most athletes to be honest when you're doing training is moving as heavy weights as possible as fast as possible it's just that he's looking to hit world records at world championships so his absolute weights are very very heavy <laughs> yeah. for everybody yeah even if you're not a strength or sorry even if you're not like a track and field athlete if you're a strength athlete mm -hmm. these are big numbers oh these are particularly in the bench press so here we have Jacko benching 231 kilos at around age 20. <laughs> and it's raw, unadulterated, not even a, a wrist wrap. Certainly not a spotter. Not a spotter. <laughs> not a spotter in sight. I know on one of these he said it on the, uh, on the video that he's doing it at midnight. Yes, he was training quite late. It's just insane strength so we have him repping 225 there and then we have him doing multiple reps in the power snatch so the power snatch is an interesting one for an athlete to use we're not really a big fan of it not because it's not effective but mostly because implementing it is more difficult than it's usually worth when you can get more bang for your buck for the power clean you can move them faster move heavy weights faster in a shorter learning curve 
uh, you saw around more productive movement. You'd have to wonder at this point because he's so young. Obviously, you're like there's where where records being hit by kind of nineteen year olds in throwing sports at the moment. Mm-hmm. Uh, certainly up to early twenty year olds there are, but you love to know if the power snatch is some sort of an auto regulator with her with his training mm-hmm. where I the d- coach if there is one is saying look just build up to heavy power snatch just say instead of heavy power cleans take the load off the body a small bit i'm going to say no. given how much of a horse jacko is by the time he was 18 i don't think he was using auto regulation movements to uh yeah. reduce the loading i think it was heavyweight fast all the time all the time so we saw him doing some power snatches for reps there and then some very impressive, considering his body weight, but aside from his body weight, single leg hops. These would be impressive if that was a 65 kilo hurdler doing those. What do you make of single leg hops? Do you feel... I don't feel like they're that beneficial. Mm-hmm. I feel like it's much more beneficial to be using the two legs. Now, obviously in certain cases, like coming back from injury, relearning those motor patterns, relearning that balance you might need the single leg hops or single leg plyometric work in general might be useful. Or if you're somebody who's running on a field a lot or getting hit a lot from the side, so like soccer players, rugby players, football players, those kind of things, the single leg jumps can be useful, particularly for learning those landing mechanics on the single leg. But for kind of just sheer power output, I Mm. prefer the the bipedal uh, jumps. Most of the single leg or unilateral jumps will be quite slow, you know, given the nature of... uh of single leg hops uh, and it's not really a I'm going to get attacked here uh, and rightly so natural movement so single leg hopping isn't really this would only happen had for example a saber tooth ripped your leg off you know yeah. doing single leg people will make the argument that the single leg hop is an element of your stride mm-hmm. which it isn't yes because you're never loading the knees and the, the hips particularly in those angles when you're sprinting. Maybe you are in the first five strides of a sprint, mm-hmm. starting from a stop. But I prefer bipedal jumps. Yeah, there. it's probably something we'll probably look into a bit deeper is the single leg, your unilateral jumps versus bipedal jumps. You know, your the body is an, an amazing machine when it comes to things like jumping and propelling yourself through the air and the coordination, intermuscular coordination that goes into... Just even a very high jump like that is incredibly impressive. Uh, and the amount of power output you'd get from those single leg hops isn't that it's, it's massively negative. It's just that it probably wouldn't do a whole lot for you. So I don't see a major problem with people doing them. No. Now, I wouldn't have a precious athlete jumping onto what looks to be a very sharp box onto a tire with a single leg hop. But if they wanted to do it onto a box jump, uh, then I wouldn't see any problem yeah. with it. A lot of things in training, a lot of times when you get athletes like this, of this caliber, the good stuff coupled with them being just immense amounts of strawberry jam means they far outweigh any like neutral or slightly negative things they do in their training because mm-hmm. he's benching 240 and he can power clean 200 you know yeah so single leg hops yeah you know they probably should feature in a prior plyometric program but it's like they're not going to be anything that moves a needle that much but benching 246 and power clean 200 is going to certainly move that needle whoa uh speaking of needles I will say as well that in the fundamentals of learning plyometrics, single leg jumping, bounding, landing, all of that stuff is, Mm -hmm. everybody will kind of agree on it being in there, you know. But obviously, Jacko isn't in the fundamental stages of learning (laughs) uh, for his plyometrics. It's insanely impressive. Yes, yeah, it is very impressive. Uh, What I suppose to dig our hole further here is like, he didn't get those heights from single leg hops. He wasn't able to single leg hop to that height because he did loads of single leg hops, he did that because he was super powerful and that power was probably generated from genetics, big power cleans, big weights, and just being a powerful athlete. Big power clean, like big, big pharma. pharma. Big pharma. <laughs> so still very impressive. So these power snatches again, so just repping, let's say 110-ish. I would have said 120. So then we have this bench press circuit. You'll see this a little bit throughout his training where he'll go from one thing into plyometric push-ups. And certainly, like, training complexes mm-hmm. uh, where you're doing one higher strength movement and then one higher power output movement is quite well uh, documented in the research and has quite good effects from much of the studies, particularly back around 10 years ago, 15 years ago, complexes for power output in training would have been very highly thought of. It would have been the kind of cutting mm-hmm. edge of training. Um, now, the mechanism of action there, there's a few competing uh, thoughts on that whether it's 
some post-activation potentiation, whether you have a long-term training effect from using complexes of kind of high strength output combined with high power output afterwards, but certainly training complexes like this, mm -hmm. maybe not the high rep stuff at the end of the circuit, but complexes like this, heavy bench rest with clap push-ups are very much, or were very much in vogue. They've seriously fallen out of favor in the last while. What you'd see a lot is either accommodating resistance, getting a lot of looking, or you'll see a lot of cluster set work. So, you know, taking breaks between reps, and there's a lot of research. And it's funny how the trends follow with research. You know, someone will see something interesting about cluster sets, and they'll come into their postgrad, and by the time they've accumulated a load of information on those cluster sets, and they'll look further into it, or their supervisor will look into it, and they'll kind of move through that and further the research, and you do see the cluster sets getting a lot of favorable look in. So that would be instead of Jacko doing bench presses and way plyometric push ups here, he'd do a fast bench at 220, rest for a second, then another rep over the course of like 60 seconds. So the idea there is like we talk about a lot as well is that if you're moving slow, you're not training your speed, you're not training the fast twitch fibers. So when you're doing those cluster sets, you're still lifting heavy weights, which is very, very important for race or force development. But the key factor there with cluster reps or cluster sets is that you're doing all of those reps to really high quality. So you're going to do a rep or two maybe, and sometimes you'll see doubles, rest for 30 seconds, and then go again. And there's a lot of favorable evidence for cluster sets. And they're done usually like maybe every 30 seconds or so. Uh, a lot of times they'll match volume with normal strength resistance training sets. Uh, and they'll see some favorable outcomes at the end of interventional trials. So that's kind of the, the newest and effective training for power. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Then, so this is a 22, 246 kilo bench press. So this is actually 243 because he didn't bench, he didn't video 246. <laughs> I love how he went 243 and then 246. Yeah. At home. With the lights off. With the lights off in his own gym with no way of escaping. No way at all of escaping. Also has clips on the bar. Like the clips not being on the bar is the last resort escape where you tilt it over yep. and there's this kind of 30 seconds of lunacy as the plates fall off from side to side. Mm -hmm. There's no escape here. Maybe that was motivation to make May it. <laughs> Maybe it was. So then we've got some overhead work. We'll see a lot of behind the neck uh, work from throwers and a dead right the easier way to do it. Yeah, I think just bigger loads moving faster as we talked about again. His clean technique and his snatch technique stays very, very similar, as you said at the start. Very consistent Yeah, that kind of slightly rounded upper back. Incredible speed, not only off the floor, but particularly in a second pull like that. That pull as the barbell passes his knees and comes up to his hip is just fiery. So here's a 130 power snatch. So he does all the right things for a power snatch to be effective. You know, he has that second and third pull moving as quickly as possible. He's moving underneath the barbell. So he's going from contraction to relaxation, contraction to relaxation of his muscle fibers, which is a very, very important part of any power development to reduce that period in between maximum contractions to do more amount of work in a short period of time. And obviously very, very important for someone doing throwing heavy objects. Here then we've just kind of a 170 power jerk. So you like it's funny using you you'd kind of think that overhead movements would kind would make sense for drawing. But again, I don't think they move the needle as much as other aspects would. As massive bench presses. As massive bench presses, massive power cleans, just being really strong yeah. and then transferring that strength into the sport. Yeah. Like it's you're like overhead movement, my arms are going to full length and I'm throwing something. So wouldn't a 220 power jerk be useful? And in some ways, of course, it's fucking useful. It's You're moving yeah. 220 overhead, but it's it's lower on the rung of useful aspects for power athletes. So not sure what... 243. Oh, this 243 again. Uh, he doesn't seem to have progressed beyond 246, so what a loser. Holy shit. I'm not going to lie. That there, mm -hmm. that video of the height push up all the way onto it that those blocks are the height of his hip yeah and he's a tall dude like mm -hmm. that is unbelievably impressive super impressive some weighted pull-ups he's very yacked back in the 60 ripped kilos. back yeah we'll see a few stair jumps and there's one stair jump coming up where you're gonna be like holy fucking shit considering he's in the 120 plus body weight uh it's hard to tell what he is oh here oh my god but there's another one on those stairs later so an interesting one ballistic bench press yeah so obviously a lot of the the negative talk around ballistic bench press is in the fact that 
in an ideal case, right, where you could drive that bench off as, as quickly and as aggressively as possible, which you'll see, like, teams of rugby players or football players doing where they have somebody catch the barrel on each side, that is quite beneficial, right? It's the heaviest weight you can move as fast as possible and you're throwing it up at the end. The issue is, in this case, a lot of that becomes limited by skill rather than limited by the actual speed you can push off at. So mm -hmm. because he has to re-catch that bar, there is an element of skill of having to throw it straight, having to, to kind of limit your outputs a small bit. Yeah, the major negative from, from that, of course, is the potential for injury. So throwing a barbell in that position doesn't allow for any room for error. So you're going to be compensating, like Dara said, for with skill. So that is something where you're looking at your valuable athletes and you're thinking, hmm do I want to risk him with a ballistic bench? And the answer is probably going to be no unless you're in that assisted environment or you're using the Smith machine. A lot of studies actually have been used to be done on ballistic benching, but you don't see it a lot as appearing anymore. So just as I'm repeated these behind the neck jerks. So we see Jacko squatting quite frequently, but never really see him push the weights massively. So I'm assuming this is 230. I think there's probably <laughs> good reason to believe it's 230. Uh, squatting with the the heels raised, um, random tangent there. But there's loads of people selling like wedges now. I've seen those. Would you not just buy a pair of weightlifting shoes and yeah, you know, would would you not just? You know? I think as well. There's people using the wedges with weightlifting shoes, mm -hmm. and that's too much. Yeah, unless you're you're. There's a weird case where if you're like a size 15 shoe, the heel height on the on a size six isn't isn't necessarily scaled up to a size. 15 shoe um in those weird cases then it is good to add it but mm -mm. i think if you're wearing a weightlifting shoe and adding a wedge it's too much i wouldn't mind if you were doing the wedge like barefoot or whatever but a lot of times you see people doing the wedge and then they'll squat in like jack was in here with running shoes or tennis shoes or you know shoes that have a really soft sole so you're you know you're you're going to make it a little bit more egregious i suppose in terms of like maximizing your performance with an increased heel uh but you know, if you have maybe, I don't know, elderly patients or something, mm -hmm. you know, it would be very beneficial in those scenarios. But uh, I wouldn't be doing it for, like, you're trying to squat maximum weight, like, put on the weightlifting shoes. Yeah, 500 pounds. Put it on. 500 pounds d denotes the need for weightlifting shoes. Jacko is obviously very strong at squatting, but we don't get to see a lot of his squatting. I'm yeah. imagining he's peaking out somewhere like 280 to 300, maybe. Yeah. Uh, which is obviously loads for a thrower. Uh, like if we looked at like Daniel Stiles, for example, or some of the other Americans, they're very, very good. Yeah. Uh, but we don't see him pushing it as much, or at least we don't see videos of him pushing it as much. Now, here's a really interesting one, overhead squats. Yeah, you just have to wonder the stage of training the overhead squats are in. Mm -hmm. Are we seeing overhead squats in there as he's two thirds away through a warm up? Mm -hmm. And he's like, oh, I need to get that overhead position a bit. Mm -hmm. Just do three overhead squats after that next snatch, you know? Mm hmm. Or is it just an off-season where he's doing some alternative work? I'd love for a thrower to have the pain-free range of motion and stability you get from or are able to do or able to demonstrate by doing overhead squats, but I couldn't see it being an in-season in, an in -season thing. The feeling of thrower's shoulders being similar to weightlifter's knees, I think, is the big, the big yeah. uh, hold back there. It's mad that... Throwing is like one of the things, along with thumbs, a big fat brain, being able to sweat <laughs> are things that really pushed us forward in terms of uh, being like the dominant predator. And your shoulder structure, super splenatus, rotator cuff, all that is so fickle. Yeah. It's so... It's, sometimes they just go. Wet paper is, is how they look sometimes when people yeah. tear them, you know. And it's it's sometimes they're so impressive, but it, when it comes to throwing, like you can overhead squat 200 kilos and be probably more sure you're not going to get injured than if you do a career of throwing a baseball. Oh, absolutely, yeah. You know, and I know baseball throwers are weird, but you'll see like javelin throwers and discus throwers and stuff. Yeah. It's, it's uh, just a, that floating mass that's not really connected to your body. Yeah. You know? Yeah. You never feel weaker or more useless at life than when you've a dislocated shoulder. And, you know, and it's just hanging down and you're like, I, I actually can't do anything. Or, you know, you don't injure your thumb all the time when you're lifting things <laughs> or you don't hurt your brain when you're thinking. So it's so funny how vulnerable the, the shoulder ligaments and joints are. are yeah. The, and tissue. So this jump coming up here on the stairs. Oh. Frightening. That is insane. Considering his weight, but just how far it is anyway. But the other thing there is he's off balance. Mm -hmm. And he just goes for the next jump anyway. Gone for the next jump. That's yeah. exactly how you want to be doing yeah. the jumps. So 22 pound throw, obviously a lot heavier. That looks pretty far to me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
uh, some aggressive pull-ups. Uh, this is part of a circuit, so he's going straight into a sled push. Um, look, he's moving fast, like so that's getting a lot of it done. Yeah. Also, like work capacity at the start of a training block, you can't uh, can't deny it. You can't deny the usefulness of that. Love sled drags, yeah. Jeez, those sleds are moving too, aren't they? Yeah, some decline bench press. Uh, no problem with this, really. It's more pressing. It's just yeah. not a great... No one does decline anymore. I really like decline. Nobody does it anymore. I like the feeling of a decline bench press. Nobody does it anymore. So he's a right-handed thrower. Here are these squats again. I'm sneaking him in there, Jacko. Stop it. <laughs> so up next, we have some heavier power cleans he seemed to have got these working weights very early in his career and then just use those which mm -hmm. makes perfect sense it's, it's what you want to be doing it's also a big parallel to kind of how weightlifters in yeah. the more structured countries like in the yeah. eastern Bloc and stuff they would have hit their lifetime maxes in their late teens early 20s and then their career consists of becoming more consistent at hitting those in competition yes it's just you become a better weightlifter through hitting those weights more consistently, not necessarily through hitting heavier and heavier weights every single comp. That third pull aggression there is insane. That's exactly what you want from heavy power cleans because you can get that same aggression with heavy power cleans that you wouldn't quite get at the same weights for power snatches or full snatches. So obviously we've seen Jacko doing a lot of heavy cleans and power cleans here, mainly power cleans. If you're somebody who wants a bigger heavier more aggressive faster and technically better clean or power clean have a look at the seeker strength clean up your clean program you'll see around eight weeks of programming two sessions per week so you'll easily be able to slot them into your normal training and we'll be here along the way to support you via the facebook group so here we have jacko squatting 220 for seven it's uh he squats Look, they're not the most aesthetic squats in terms of movement, but they are moving well. Um, yeah. Neither do they need to. No. Like, no. they don't need to look great, uh, but they are strong. That that back strength here is insane. Yeah, yeah. So he, you don't really need to be in those laced 200s for the, the throw or, you know, early 300s. If you can, it's better, as we're talking about. It is great, but it's not, uh, it's certainly not necessary. But you do want to be... I would think pretty proficient with yeah. pretty heavy squats given the value of them. Now here again, just <laughs> just benching 205 for multiple reps. <laughs> There's just nothing to say on this. There is nothing to say no. on this. So he said a 250 attempt, but we never got to see if he did ever attempt 250. Then this is 176 for three. Mm -hmm. yeah. Just... With a bench press pair. Yeah, and no shoes on. No shoe. He seems to do all his power cleans with no shoes on or late leaves, which is interesting. I wonder why he does that. Yeah. I just feel good. So 431 <laughs> kilo sumo deadlift. So, like, we don't really like sumo deadlift. 430 kilo, 431 kilo trap bar deadlift. So we're just not major fans of the trap bar deadlift, given that it's just not really a great squat and it's not really a great deadlift, you know, and it's... It's very useful for for jumping if you're doing weighted jumps in certain scenarios. It can be quite useful for that, and it's great for like I don't know elderly patients and stuff. But for when it comes to athletes, it just doesn't give you the most bang for a buck when you're picking training tools to do. Yeah, I think where it can come in is like if you can't get someone to squat and deadlift, mm -hmm. and you need them to do something heavy once a week, you know, then it's a useful tool. But as Gareth was saying, it's not. It's not the best scalpel to be operating with. What I really like is the three-sided trap bar deadlift and then doing split squats with them. Now, most gyms don't have those, so it's... Is that the transformer bar? Might be. something. There seems to be a couple of them out there, contact yeah. bars or whatever, but I really like the look of those for split squats. Uh, that's a really nice way of loading it up uh, if you want to get very heavy with those split squats and not have a bar in the back. That would actually be... If you could get a full range of motion split squat with that three-sided trap bar, that would be a preferable way of loading those yeah. than a barbell, in fact. But it's obviously super specific and not that important. No, like the big advantage of that style of split squat is the lower center of gravity, you know. Mm -hmm. we, if we really load you up and put a big heavy barbell on your back, there's a lot of balancing going on there for something like a split squat. So obviously with the hex bar or the three-sided hex bar, it's mm -hmm. so much lower you're only just kind of holding on to it down there. It's like people using a counterweight as they walk across a tightrope, you know, it just makes it a bit easier. I like that you can unload the spine as well or not like 
loaded classically with the weight on top uh, when you're doing the uh, the weight or the three sided hex bar squats, slit squats. But you don't get them in your gym, so it's impossible. <laughs> Just for, forget about it. Bring an angle grinder to the gym. <laughs> I don't think people would appreciate that. So 230. Bench press, just super consistent with his benching strength. Now, Garf, this brings up Go on. my major question for this entire video. All right. Is how is he not playing rugby? He's in one of the most rugby, the most rugby mad nation in the world. Mm -hmm. He's displaying massive amounts of talent in really important things like power output, mm -hmm. speed and strength. Mm -hmm. And yet he becomes a thrower and not play for... Probably the most renowned rugby team in the world. Not the best rugby team in the world, but the most renowned yeah. rugby team in the so world. So you know Ireland is the best rugby team in the world at the moment. But it's because both his parents are throwers. That's I why know. that's why I know. that's why he's not playing rugby. It's because they just got him in early. He got a taste of that junior world championships when he was a teenager, and I assume he was just like, Fuck rugby. He definitely enjoys bench pressing more than all the rugby players as well. Do you, Do you know, know when he's in school and stuff? Yes. Do you know what's What's more important than that, though, this 200 kilo power clean from Jacko in his bare feetsies to essentially standing. Yep. Essentially zero, like the bottom of a jerk dip, a short jerk dip. A short jerk dip. Two fucking hundred kilos jumping back. This is ludicrous. This is 200 Not kilos. A bother. Think about this for a minute. 200 kilos for a power clean like that. Think about that for a second. It's insane. And he's pulling at the, his chest basically standing. It is insane. No, that's, that is, that's probably the most, that's the most impressive lift of the whole thing. I remember watching Clarence power clean 190. Do you remember that? Was it 190? In Cork? It yes. 190, I think. And yeah. seeing that weight move that fast and him catching it, mm -hmm. certain things like that, it's like seeing a massive person sprint really fast. It just kind of blurs in your brain. It, mm -hmm. it looks so utterly different in person. 200 kilos mm -hmm. is 10 kilos more than that and Clarence is one of the best weightlifters alive today I think the most impressive lifts or one of my favourite lifts of all time is the 200 kilo power clean from Ilya in the 2012 training hall in London but we're not here to talk about Ilya we're here to talk about Jacko doing some accommodating resistance uh, squats or half squats or box squats uh, again as we talked about earlier the accommodating resistance does seem to be getting some favourable thoughts mm -hmm. in the literature so be interesting to see how that plays out in a couple of years, how the uh, the the kind of research goes on accommodating resistance. Some core work, so we'll just see a lot of core work, lower back, resisted here. Uh, all good stuff, all very useful for a drawer. Yeah. Training done in the garage in these hard times, stay safe. So this is... Looks like 220. Some weighted dragon... Some fancy fight. camera work. Some rotational work. Starting the strimmer. He's got a lot of work to do later. <laughs> And then some very aggressive, heavy dumbbell snatches. That's probably a 100 kilo dumbbell, but it just looks <laughs> super small when he's holding it. I think the big advantage I'd see in those is that slowing the weight down on the way back down. Mm -hmm. That work of eccentrically loading the lower back and the shoulders and the upper back uh, as you're coming down, I think is just uh, invaluable. So if you could let us know about any athletes that you want us to check out, as a lot of the athletes we see are recommended by people, which is great. And we can go look at them. And a lot of times you guys know if there's a lot of training footage. So please, please leave some recommendations below and we will absolutely go take a look at them. And if we can find some good training footage, we'd be delighted to react to them in the video.